Why do we celebrate the beginning of the Reformation, that day in 1517, almost 500 years ago? That's when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the bulletin board, a few pieces of paper representing a request for a public scholarly debate. In a few months, the whole world had been turned inside out and upside down. What happened? I'm reminded of an interaction I had with the president of the Catholic Biblical Association. The CBA is a professional association for scholars of the Bible, and every year they call a meeting where hundreds of university types gather to discuss topics particular to that year. Since I was aspiring to be a university type in biblical studies, I thought it good to join the CBA and attend their annual meetings. This one was in San Francisco, on the campus of San Francisco University, which sits atop one of those magnificent mountains with a lovely view of San Francisco Bay and the downtown region. The president of the association was a nice enough man, a Jesuit priest, about five foot one, a rather wizened, diminutive fellow, stooped over from a lifetime of smoking, if I remember correctly. I think he was about 80 years old. I was a natural target for him because I was the youngest person there, still in my 20s, wide-eyed and innocent, just trying to impress older scholars with my fancy new postmodern ideas. He and Mark Smith, a professor at New York University, overtook me while I was taking an evening constitutional around the campus, and the three of us adopted that erudite scholarly pose, hands clasped behind, leaning forward, talking more to the ground than to each other, walking slowly with legs swinging wide with each step. The conversation was friendly enough, mostly about the marvelous beauties of San Francisco and the university campus, when the president noticed my name tag, which had on it where I was from, Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. I was not a young Catholic scholar, as he had assumed. He said, Concordia, what are you doing here? I said, well, this is a good place to increase my scholarship. Why even bother, he said. And then he said something unrepeatable. It wasn't filthy, but it was ugly and insulting, and it made the rest of our conversation rather hostile. Now, I'll pause here to explain. <clears throat> Afterwards, I went to my teachers, the faculty of Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, to tell them about this ugly encounter with the president of the Catholic Biblical Association. What gives? I asked. Well, they explained to me that ten years previously there had been... He had been an important figure in an attempt by the Roman Catholic Church to create unity between itself and the Protestant churches, including the Lutherans. Things were going along smoothly, and it looked like some common ground was developing that might actually heal this nearly 500-year schism. Well, the Lutherans noticed that the statement on justification was a little soft, so they put a question forward. Now, you have to understand, my dear Lutheran friends, that North American Lutherans tend to be impolitic, shall we say, less than diplomatic, and in truth, downright rude. And we have a tendency to come across as arrogant. We're right and you're wrong. Nevertheless, the question is important. God alone does the work of bringing sinners into the kingdom, right? The answer from the Roman Catholics? No, not God alone, but also dot, dot, dot. Whatever follows the dot, dot, dot is wrong, plain and simple. God alone does the work of saving sinners, plain and simple. Since the Roman Catholics refused to agree to that basic Christian teaching, the Lutherans withdrew from the meeting which essentially destroyed a lot of hard work by this man who was now hostile to poor Dave Duke, who had just been 17 years old when that meeting had taken place. 
he followed up with another question. Is the book of Jonah historical? Huh. Is the book of Jonah historical? Now, how, how to be diplomatic about it? How to answer the question without shutting down the conversation? I, I mean, I, I, had a, <clears throat> I had a professional interest in continuing the, the conversation. I said, well, I suppose it could be historical. When he heard that, the president of the Catholic Biblical Association made a terrible retching sound, and he spit at me. He spit at my feet. As sure as I'm standing here, I'm telling you, this erudite gentleman scholar spit at my feet. Entertaining the very idea that something miraculous could have happened was too much for this Roman Catholic, which reveals the state of Catholic biblical scholarship. I hearkened to the voice of my teachers who told many stories of being accosted at fancy cocktail parties by all their fellow university types. You don't really believe those crazy old stories of miracles. In the Old Testament, do you? Answer. Can the God of Israel raise the dead? And that's the rub, my friends. Most biblical scholars in North America do not believe in the resurrection. Mark Smith, professor at New York University, and I were breakfasting at a Starbucks now, this was in the days before Tim Hortons had reached San Francisco. And we were talking about the president of the Catholic Biblical Association spitting at my feet. And he said, well, now, Dave, <laughs> the idea that the book of Jonah is historical is a bit much, don't you think? This is why Lutherans are Lutherans. This is why we have to maintain our identity as Lutherans insisting on the basic teachings of the Christian faith, among them that the idea that God alone does the work of saving sinners, and the idea that the Bible is a faithful witness to the work of God. It's not just to hold back the academic horde, either. It wasn't too long ago and I had the pleasure of helping an elderly man get ready to go to his grave. At his deathbed, it was just the two of us for a while. And he said, I feel pretty bad about how I treated my wife. I said, you probably should feel bad. It was no secret how he'd treated her. A lifetime of alcohol-driven behavior, I'm, I'm sure you can imagine. I'm worried about it, he said. Are you sorry about it? I asked. Oh, yes, he said, very sorry. I wish I could go back and undo it all. Well, don't worry about that, I said. God has taken it all away. He doesn't hold it against you. He doesn't? the old man asked, and he was looking at me. I mean, there's no more diplomacy needed, no fancy words. That's why Jesus died, to take away all your sins, suffering on the cross. I added, it's true, the consequences are all around you. And three or four of his sons grew up to be pretty bad alcoholics themselves, basically repeating what their father did, and the one who didn't become an alcoholic, was a terribly judgmental, insufferable wretch. And the girl, well, she was, she was off. She was 60 years old, and I call her a girl because she was nothing more than a girl emotionally. It's true, I said. The consequences are all around you, but God will do the work of saving your children. For you, right now, you are baptized and you may depart in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That speech is an impossibility without the Lutheran Reformation. I gave him the Lord's Supper, 
which is in remembrance of the Lord's own words and according to his command, which is witnessed in four different places in the Bible. He grew silent as it was time for me to leave. On my way out the door with my back turned to him, my my hand on the doorknob, he said, Thank you, Pastor. He died a few hours later. Five hundred years ago, God turned the world upside down and inside out to preserve this saving word, don't you see? Five hundred years later, God has given you Lutherans the task of carrying it forward. God alone saved sinners, and the Bible is a faithful witness to that word.